Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, we have a special guest joining me, Dr. Joaquin Garcia. Dr. Garcia is currently the Chair of Anatomic Pathology and the Digital Pathology Program at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Dr. Garcia has been at Mayo for about 14 years, and he is a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology, and he has expertise in head and neck, frozen section, and molecular pathology. He's published over 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts on these various topics and authored several book chapters and, and books. So thank you, Dr. Garcia, for coming on this podcast. It's great to have you here. We're going to talk about digital pathology and how this can and will impact the pathology practice in patient care. I know we're still implementing digital pathology within our own Mayo Clinic practice, so not everyone is familiar with what that is exactly. So maybe we'll start by just level setting. Can you tell us what digital pathology is? Absolutely. First of all, let me let me start by thanking you for the invitation this morning, Dr. Pritt. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here, speak on behalf of a lot of our colleagues and friends who invested significant time and effort into bringing digital pathology to Mayo Clinic and making it a reality for our practice. Uh, so digital pathology in sum is uh, replacing the practice of traditional pathology with digital imaging technology. It's replacing analog practice um, such as um, glass slides, paper reports with digital images and scanned reports. And it allows us to uh, deploy digital tools to share images, share reports, annotate them, uh, educate one another, inspire questions from one another, um, and make sure we get expertise on all cases necessary. Of course, when, when you go digital, uh, as, as our colleagues in the Department of Radiology saw decades ago, it affords you the opportunity to uh, take the advantage of some long-term cost savings with uh, storage, access, transport, sharing of glass slides. It also allows you to mitigate the risk of losing slides, breaking slides, which becomes important for patients as they move to other institutions, want to enroll in clinical trials, uh, or that material wants to be ac uh, accessed by investigators for research. Lastly, digital pathology puts us in position for uh, operational efficiency of the diagnostic workflow, uh, pivoting some of our human resources to other value add activities. Well, that's great. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Um, I'm really excited for it. I actually have this big, beautiful, high-resolution monitor now in my office. Um, I haven't been able to quite use it yet with infectious disease pathology because what we look at is so tiny, um, but I know that a lot of our pathologists are already using it. Um, so maybe you could tell us a bit about that. How does digital pathology change the way pathologists work? Great question, and that's where it's at. That's what everyone's interested in. So we first have to understand how do pathologists work today, or for many of us worked yesterday. So once a slide is generated in a traditional workflow, that slide will ultimately, in a system such as ours, will make its way to a pathology reporting uh, a specialist or a medical secretary who works in a group or a pod of medical secretaries. That case will then be distributed to a trainee, a resident, or a fellow who will preview a case and then take that case, uh, those glass slides and the paperwork to a consultant pathologist such as myself or yourself to review the case together. We may order additional stains. And when we order those additional stains, the pathologist will have that conversation with the resident or fellow. They'll write it down on the paperwork. They'll then take that paperwork and glass slides back to the pod or group of uh, pathology reporting specialists or medical secretaries with expertise in this space. And they will then order the stains. That message will be sent to the lab and those, those slides will come back and we'll repeat that process over and over. With digital pathology, once we generate those slides, here currently we generate those slides on Hilton 10 in Rochester. We take them down to Hilton 3, we scan them. Once we scan those slides, they are now available to everyone in the enterprise, including myself, the resident, the fellow, but also an expert in say, for example, Mayo Clinic Arizona, if we had to lean on them for whatever reason. So that's the, the, the first thing is it's universally available. Now in that case, we still, we still try to put it in the hands of our residents or our fellows early, but they don't have to wait for the pathology reporting specialist to quote unquote, give them the case. It's available to them. It might be available to them at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., which was unheard of 
prior to digital pathology. In the analog workflow, you had to wait for someone to come to work and then bring the cases to you. If a clinician or if, if a clinician calls someone like me or yourself and says, hey, I have a really important question about this case, can you look at it for me? I don't have to call a pathology reporting specialist to help me find this case. Can you contact the resident or fellow? I'm not sure where it is in the life cycle of this case. No, I have access. I can actually grant access to my clinical colleague, show them what's going on so they can have a more high level, sophisticated, impactful uh, interaction with the patient. That's where digital pathology puts us today. Uh, it also gives us plenty of tools such as measurement. Previously, if a, if a trainee wanted to measure the size of a tumor or the distance of a tumor to a surgical margin, say, we would use a dotting pen and dot ink on the glass slide and then try and measure that with the ruler. Now we can use annotation tools that are obviously more accurate. And when I say there's a two millimeter lesion, my, my resident or fellow knows exactly what I was measuring. It's so fascinating and exciting, all of the opportunities it opens up, especially for sharing cases with colleagues for training. So I think it's a game changer, this innovative technology. So how does this impact patient care specifically? Yeah, great question. I remember just recently, a couple months ago, I was in Jacksonville, Florida for a meeting with some, some of our experts and leaders in the digital pathology space. And I happened to be fortunate enough to have dinner with Dr. Jim Jacob. And Dr. Jacob, formerly the leader of uh, breast, uh, breast and melanoma surgery at Mayo Clinic Rochester, now located at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, was telling me about a case where he was going to see a patient. He was going into the room of a patient and had questions about the breast pathology. He tried to contact the, uh, the pathologist. The pathologist was off-site, wasn't at the hospital but was still able to access the images, as was Dr. Aziz Nassar. So Dr. Jacob at that point actually had two expert uh, breast pathologists to tap on, the, the primary pathologist from the case as well as Dr. Nassar. So he could either respect the vacation of one colleague uh, or allow them to step up. It turns out both happened. Both those uh, pathologists stepped up. So that is very impactful when Dr. Jacob is walking in to see that patient and has questions at the last minute. Are we going to operate? Are we going to radiate? Should you plan on staying in town for a week or, or longer than that with or without your family? To, to empower Dr. Jacob for those answers with that patient is exactly where we want to position ourselves in the digital pathology program. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Garcia. It's such a major difference, as you mentioned already, in the conventional or yesterday world. Um, it would have required someone to pull those slides that would have taken time to take them if they had gone to the warehouse trying to get them have someone sit down and look at them and that could take a day or more so this instantaneous ability to just look at a slide and help a patient speaking as an educator and someone who's pulled a lot of archive slides as well i can tell you that the issues with breakage that with them fading over time and then having to get a new section are significant of course i've broken my fair share of slides as well and that's going to go away with digital pathology and the slides will be captured in their beautiful colorful state um, and if the actual slide fades over time the digital image will not so I think it's fantastic. Um, so based on your experience, how common is digital pathology outside of Mayo and healthcare institutions right now? Um, and if it's not common, how would a pathologist learn more about using digital pathology or the tools and solutions already available? Excellent question. I think it's fair to say that Mayo Clinic uh, and all of our sites is a leader in the digital pathology space. And there's several reasons. And, and when we look at the reasons why we're a leader, you can, you can effectively see why it's difficult for some institutions, whether they be hospitals or clinics, to get off the ground. Here at Mayo Clinic, we have support at the CEO level from Dr. Faruja, as well as the Mayo Clinic CPC and the department level. We also have tremendous leadership champions at every single level, wherever you're talking about lab assistance, lab processing assistance, histotech, cytotechs, operational leaders as well we have champions across the board. That is relatively unique. It also takes expertise. We have built our expertise by hiring and training our own. And we've also uh, found space. Space is difficult to come by. When you wanna go from a histology lab that's entirely analog and then take it digital, you may not necessarily need less space. You probably need more space when you first start out. With that being said, the, the people, 
the space, uh, the money, and those types of resources really put us in front of the crowd. But if you look elsewhere, uh, domestically and internationally, you certainly have scattered use cases uh, within practices. For example, uh, maybe the, the liver practice, the biopsy practice is fully digital, or our education is fully digital. Research has uh, digital capabilities. So you see that and you see scattered champions, but the ability to practice digital pathology at scale, frankly, takes uh, a tremendous investment uh, from the top to the bottom and the left to the right. And we're fortunate in that regard. Scanning slides is an important part of bringing digital pathology into practice, but, but creating digital pathology powered workflows and deploying those in your practice is really next level. To this end, for those out there who wanna learn more about digital pathology and bringing it into practice, I would encourage you to uh, reach out to the Digital Pathology Association or the American Society of Clinical Pathology. They have adequate resources and, and fair number of expertise available to people. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Garcia. Um, I imagine that people are going to be reaching out to you, to our other colleagues, the few places across the country that are using digital pathology um, for more information. And of course, as this becomes more commonplace, it'll be easier to get that information. So thank you for sharing those great resources. Now, you gave us a fantastic patient story. Um, Maybe you can elaborate now on uh, what innovations you've seen since we have been implementing digital pathology for the Mayo Clinic practice. The energy around innovation in digital pathology is tremendous, Dr. Pritt. Mm. Be incredibly proud of what we see within the labs and the allied health staff and the consultant staff um, going, going above and beyond to make innovation happen within our department. You could start with algorithm development with talented consultants like Dr. Rish Pai at Mayo Clinic Arizona or Dr. Roger Murray at Mayo Clinic Rochester. Dr. Pai is working on a colorectal algorithm and has been, has been successful, even published, that will help better prognosticate and stage colorectal cancer patients. Dr. Roger Moreira has been working on an eosinophilic esophagitis algorithm, which is an important disease for both pediatric and adult patients and requires meticulous accounting of eosinophils and evaluation of the basal layer of squamous epithelium. But with AI, he'll take that to the next level. We also see innovation coming our way through our AI sandbox, which is a collaboration with Iphoria. In that AI sandbox, we have over 60 pathology consultants ready for projects, bringing their brightest ideas to the table. And those will be the next projects that we start talking about in the same fashion we talk about Rish Pai and Roger Marrero. We also see excellent promise in our high value digital assets effort led by Drs. Tom Flo and Chris Garcia. Dr. Chris Garcia is from Computational Pathology and Artificial Intelligence Division, whereas Dr. Flo is from the Division of Anatomic Pathology. So in addition to retrospectively scanning 25 million slides, at least 5 million in the next three years, once we scan those high value digital assets from select disease types, whether they be in dermatology or, or GI disease, we can then connect that data with orthogonal data sets, such as radiology and clinical outcome. Another innovation we have seen is our colleagues in the Department of Dermatology using digital pathology to create a novel interaction with their patients, taking digital pathology to the bedside. Similar to a surgeon showing an MRI or a PET scan to their patient, we now have our clinical colleagues showing digital pathology because those images are available in the electronic medical record. The last thing I would mention is efforts in the anatomic pathology lab of the future. Anatomic pathology labs have looked the same for over a century now. The AP lab of the future effort, which is led by several people in the divisions of anatomic pathology, uh, uh, CPAI, business development. This AP lab of the future effort allows us to bring novel devices into the Mayo Clinic campus and laboratories, evaluate them, determine how we can make them better and bring that instrumentation to our practice in the future. This is really exciting. I'm very excited for it. So where is this all going? Where do you see the future of digital pathology? I think the future of digital pathology benefits the patient most, Dr. Pritt. Mm -hmm. I think the benefits can be seen in all three shields of our practice. If we talk about education, you can look with the pioneering efforts that Dr. Nassar, Dr. Malsheski, Dr. Melanie Boyce, uh, and Marie-Christine Aubrey are creating for a novel interaction between the pathologist and the patient, the clinician and the patient, the pathologist and the training, and the pathologist and the pathologist as we go forward. 
In research, I mentioned that a tissue registry, we have launched an effort to scan 5 million slides over three years. That's a retrospective effort that positions us incredibly well to contribute make major contributions to the Mayo Clinic platform, as well as the digital pathology platform. As far as practice goes, I would focus on that, the digital pathology platform. The digital pathology platform will be our response to what the world of pathology needs to practice pathology in a, in a digital ecosystem, allowing pathologists in Arizona, Florida, Rochester, and the Mayo Clinic Health System to share cases, share expertise, working seamlessly and frictionlessly. The digital pathology platform will also create other opportunities for our practice to engage with the outside world, whether it be research or education, biopharma. Well, thank you, Dr. Garcia. I love that vision, and I look forward to seeing this as it's going to contribute to our three shields, as you mentioned, which are clinical practice, education, and research. So I'll end with one last question, which is what concerns do you have for digital pathology? We focused on the positives, but is there anything that keeps you up at night, anything that you worry about, uh, how this may go? That's a fair question, Dr. Pritt. I do have a couple concerns, and I don't think they're unique to me. Uh, my first concern is about our people, Dr. Pritt. Mm -hmm. Our people have been working very hard, as you know, even prior to the pandemic, through the pandemic. And now, as we make our way into this digital pathology transformation, we often ask more of our staff. We ask them to learn both traditional workflows that are analog, as well as those that are, are digital. Working in this hybrid world can be taxing on our staff, whether we're talking about the labs, the, uh, the pods of, of pathology reporting specialists, the trainees, or the consultants. So I worry about our people. They've invested a lot, and we need some of the returns from the digital pathology program, namely uh, the gains on efficiency in our practice. I also worry about technology. Although technology has taken us incredibly far in digital pathology, we have a way to go. If you look at the deployment of digital pathology scanners and liquid-based microscopy, um, renal pathology, infectious disease pathology, and hematopathology, they're not at the level of clinical adequacy in our opinion. To this point, I worry about technology meeting our expectations. Okay. I also worry about market adoption. I've mentioned a couple of times that Mayo Clinic is a leader in this space. I worry about market adoption because we look forward to a world where we're actually completely digital. We leave, we leave hybrid workflows behind, but to do that, for example, our consult practice will also have to be digital. And so we look for our clientele to also take this digital pathology journey with us, if not after us. Lastly, I worry about expense and reimbursement. Everything is expensive, as you know, Dr. Pritt, whether you're talking about devices or space or people and reimbursement for digital pathology effectively does not exist at this point. In 2023, we just started tracking the use of digital pathology, whether it be scanning or rendering a digital interpretation, but whether or not we get reimbursed in the next couple of years is to be determined. We'll see how long we wait for that. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of things to consider. I'm sure there'll be bumps in the road. I think it's still very exciting and we'll figure them out as we go, but there are some big questions there. Well, this has been really uh, inspiring and energizing and um, I look forward to see what's coming in the future. So thank you again, Dr. Garcia, for joining us today and giving us all of this great information. Thank you, Dr. Pritt, for your engagement of the Digital Pathology Program as well as your leadership in the department. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday. <laughs>